We're all looking forward to it. Um, you can begin as soon as you feel like you're ready. Good luck. So for my project, I want to do something meaningful more to me. So since I am in the area of scuba diving, that's what I should. So for my driving question, it is, what physiological effects do certain gases have on scuba divers at depth, and how do they do So what is scuba diving? SCUBA stands for Self-Contained Underwater Breathing Apparatus, and in short, this just means equipment using compressed gas for breathing while underwater. So Boyle's Law, what is it and how does it affect scuba diving? So Boyle's Law is the relationship between pressure and volume, and they are inversely related. This affects scuba diving because divers are constantly ascending and descending, which means that their pressure and volume are constantly changing. And with this information, it helps them calculate how much air they will have at the depth that they are going to achieve. So Boyle's Law is represented by the equation P1V1 equals P2V2. This is the initial pressure and volume is equal to the value of the pressure and volume after the gas change. So pressure and volume are inversely related. This means as one increases, the other one decreases, and vice versa. So to adapt to these defensive pressures, divers will equalize their air spaces by using the ambient or the surrounding pressure. And there are three different methods that they use, or these are the main ones. There is the Valsalva technique, which is just holding your nose and blowing, the chew and go method, and the swallowing method. Now essentially, it's just going to feel like you're going up a mountain because all you're doing is popping your ears. So Boyle's Law affects all other physics laws that are involved in scuba diving. You have Charles' Law. Charles' Law is the relationship between temperature and pressure. It says that gas tends to expand whenever it's heated. Then you have Dalton's Law. Dalton's Law is essentially just a recipe. It says that the partial pressures or the ingredients, the sum of all of that, is equal to the total pressure of failure. And then Henry's Law. Henry's Law, Henry's law states that the longer you are underwater, the more nitrogen your body absorbs. And then you have Archimedes principle. Though it is not technically a law, we use it as a law, and it is just dealing with buoyancy. It is the reason for why we sink or why we float. Is there one of the equalizing techniques that works better than others? Or um, one it depends. Whenever I first started, the Valsalva technique helped a lot, but now I just follow technique helps better. So it just depends. Sometimes you do all of them. Mm -hmm. Does so its so effectiveness vary by person, like by their own body and what will work best for them? Not really. It just depends. I mean, it'll change often. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Okay. Sometimes you have to rise to a um, lower pressure and then try it again. Start with so it just depends. Okay. Thank you. So the danger is diver space due to boil water. There are four main diving maladies that can occur. The first one is air envelope. It's often called gas envelope. It's whenever small bubbles of air are obstructing the blood flow. The second diving malady is spontaneous pneumothorax. It's whenever the pneumothorax or the air inside the chest cavity for suddenly so without reason or cause behind the wire happens. And then you have the medium style emphysema. This is whenever pockets of air are surrounding the heart or the central blood vessels. And then the fourth malady is the subcutaneous emphysema. It's whenever pockets of air are in the tissues under the skin. So the difference in pressure to our bodies, this chart shows the bars or atmosphere of pressure and the weight of air on our bodies at whatever depth we are at. So currently, at the surface, so what we are right now, we are experiencing one bar or one atmosphere of pressure and 14.7 psi or pounds per square inch of weight of air on our bodies. So whenever a diver descends down to 10 meters, they experience two bars or two atmospheres of pressure and their weight of air on their body is doubled to 29.4 pounds per square inch. And as the diver descends down deeper, all of these numbers increase. So what are the physiological effects of partial pressures? So understanding Dalton's Law, like I said, it is just a recipe. You take the ingredients and all of them add it together equals the sum or the total. So different mixes of partial pressures can add up to different risks. 
if you have a high oxygen mix at death, then you can risk oxygen toxicity. If you have a high nitrogen mix at death, you can risk nitrogen narcosis. And if you have a low oxygen mix at death, you can risk hypoxia or the lack of oxygen. Can you tell us, or you may be going this later in New Orleans, okay, but the, the first two, um, the oxygen toxicity and the nitrogen narcosis, can you tell us what those symptoms look like or the, the effects? I mean, it's in the letter slide if you don't want to. Uh, no, we can wait that. We can wait. That's fine. So, partial pressure is also increased with depth. So, as the diver depth descends down, the pressure on them starts to increase. That also affects the partial pressure. This means that if a diver has a hypoxic mix at the surface or a low oxygen mix at the surface for them to sustain life, then let's say they are using that mix at 100 feet, it may be more substantial for them to breathe down there than it would be at the surface. So some of these risks of increasing oxygen or higher partial pressures are oxygen toxicity and decompression sickness. And both of these uh, maladies occur whenever the body has too much of a certain gas. So the different partial pressures that are with oxygen, nitrogen, helium, and different mixed gases. So oxygen has different mixes for different types of dives, and it also becomes toxic at different depths. Nitrogen, an increase in nitrogen will decrease the risk of oxygen toxicity, but nitrogen itself can become too risk to different diving maladies. And nitrogen can become narcotic at certain depths. Helium, it is essentially just a replacement inert gas for nitrogen, it reduces the effects of nitrogen narcosis because it has little to no narcotic effect. And different mixed gases would be enriched air nitrox, heliox, and trimix. Summary setup. Uh, water pressure is it different in different bodies of water? So, like for example, salt water versus fresh water? Um, it has like a like point some number difference, and so that also has to like difference with the um, the meters. So in like fresh water, 10 meters is 34 or 33 feet and the other one and then salt water is like 34 feet yeah. or the reverse one of the two. Right. But it's it's mainly just the difference in um, the meters more or the depth more than that. So the partial pressures of oxygen, first off you have 21%, this is what we are breathing right now, it is our normal. And then you have 32% or nitrox 32. This is the most common that divers use in the field. Then you have 36%, which is called nitrox 36. And dive, chart, dive charters or dive shops can only mix up to 40% due to it coming back at the dive shop if the diver risks oxygen toxicity. The other mix is 100% only, or it's medical use only, it is for whenever a diver risk hypoxia and they need more nitrogen or oxygen going through their system. So higher partial pressures of oxygen increase the bottom time but they do not increase the depth, thus then risking oxygen toxicity. So oxygen hypoxia is not enough oxygen. It is anything below 20%. Oxygen toxicity is too much oxygen. It is anything above 20%. The partial pressure of 16% is the threshold for hypoxia, and 10% is the minimum to sustain life. The partial pressure of 1.4 is the moderate risk of toxicity, while 1.6 is a more substantial risk of toxicity. So, the central nervous system oxygen toxicity is damage from higher than tolerated amounts of oxygen. Sometimes the symptoms would be tunnel vision, ringing of the ears, convulsions, and to, for treatment, you just lower the percent of oxygen, and it does not always have immediate results, but if you respond immediately, then it can be treated. And so even at, at the threshold for substantial risk, is this ever a lethal? Um, the threshold, yes, it can be. It just depends on the person. Um, some have, it, it also depends on their immune system. Some have better immune system, and right. they can handle the uh, effects better, mm -hmm. rather than somebody else who So the partial pressures of nitrogen. Nitrogen risks two different diving maladies. The first diving malady being nitrogen narcosis. This is breathing nitrogen under pressure because it becomes narcotic at death. And some signs and symptoms will be those related to alcohol intoxication 
or that state of being drunk. This would be poor judgment or short term memory loss. And treatment for this would just be simply getting out of the water, or if symptoms severe, then they can end the dive. So then the second one being patient's disease, often called decompression, sickness, or the bits. This is a diving injury of pain or paralysis that is due to a rapid ascent causing these painful bubbles of air to form. So absorption of nitrogen is, uh, happens at death and it causes these bubbles along with a rapid ascent which also forms these bubbles. And oversaturation of nitrogen is whenever the body has too much nitrogen that it can, that it can, that it can store. So this happens whenever you're at death for too long a period. The rapid descent allows that nitrogen to come out too quickly that it can, forming these bubbles. And to minimize both these effects, there is we use different mixes for different safety reasons. So the partial pressure of helium, it is a replacement inert gas for nitrogen because it has little to no narcotic effect. It also reduces the risk of oxygen toxicity and nitrogen narcosis and it is used to make certain gas mixes such as heliox, which is oxygen, helium, and trimix, which is nitrogen, oxygen, and helium. Is it just me or does that not sound nearly as harmful as the other two? Yeah, um, there's just like different courses for them and it's easier but there's more training behind it. More training. So different mixed gases, we have enriched air nitrox. This increases oxygen while decreasing nitrogen, so it decreases the effects of nitrogen narcosis and it decreases the effects of the bins. But, or this means that they have more bottom time, but they do not have a deeper depth that they can achieve because then they would risk oxygen toxicity. Heliox avoids narcotic effects and allows deeper depths. This does have a hypothermia risk because of the high thermal conductivity and it is also more expensive. Trimix reduces nitrogen and oxygen along with the narcotic and toxic effects that it has. They use this at the deepest of dives because it allows the diver to have more safety whenever they're uh, obtaining the dive that they want, or attain, obtaining the depth that they want to achieve. So depths of narcosis and toxicity. So the recommended depth for recreation divers is 60 feet. This is developed over time through trial and error dives. This is the typical limit allowed by most dive charters without further training for safety reasons, and those safety reasons would include the fact that nitrogen becomes more narcotic at 60 feet. So the recommended depth for advanced divers is 100 feet. Divers have a higher chance of becoming narcotic at 100 feet rather than 60 feet because it, the side effects are more severe. And this is also the same depth with four times more atmospheric pressure than the surface. And divers are not used to this, and if they don't have the proper training, then they don't know how to adapt to this, resulting in certain maladies. So the is, there, is there certain training that they would go through to be able to do that? For example, like people are going in our space, they, they go through simulations that, that they kind of are getting used to the, the pressure and stuff in space. Is there something similar like that for divers? Yes, there are a bunch of different trainings, and I talk about some of them later on. I'm sorry. Um, oh, no, you're good. So the maximum depth for recreation divers is 130 feet, and divers shouldn't reach this depth without a deep diver training course, but they can and they do. So this depth has limited bottom time breathing air because a diver's air is consumed a lot quicker at deeper depths. This is also the same depth where the saturation rate increases with deeper depths, which means they are storing excessive amounts of nitrogen in their body leading to oversaturation. So extended range depths are anything greater than 130 feet, whether it be 150, 200, 1,000 plus. So anything greater than 130 feet is also known as technical diving. Technical diving requires more intense training, equipment, and diving philosophies. They intentionally supersaturate to work at greater pressures and enhance their safety. And their use of special mix is trimix because it reduces the effects of oxygen toxicity, nitrogen in our cases, and increases their energy compression time. Now their energy compression time is the amount of time it takes to bleed off all the nitrogen that they have has stored for that last dive before they can enter again for another dive. So different trainings for different areas. So the most common first trainings divers receive are their open water diver and their 
react right in stress and rescue. So the open water diver course, this is where they learn how to dive. They learn the basics to scuba physics and the learning skills necessary for survival in the water. There are three parts to this. They have the classroom training, the confined water training, and the open water training dives. Now some divers will just stop here, but if they want to continue down on their diver path, they will then take the react right and stress and rescue course. So this course, they learn the basic first aid, CPR, O2 administration, and AED use. They learn the emergency procedures above and below water and how to assess these different maladies. Do the trainings vary by person for any reason? Um, weight, gender, anything like that? No. Um, some <coughs> trainings are, the trainings would only vary by the different dive charters. Right. Because you have different uh, organizations. Um, SSI or uh, certain trainings will have the react right stress and rescue. You still have to do the pool work mm -hmm. or confined water training. And whoever your instructor is, you most likely have to lift them up to the surface mm -hmm. no matter the weight. So it depends on your instructor if you are looking to get somebody more fit or. Yeah. Right, that's what you're saying. So generally speaking, like the, the, the body weight or height, that, that doesn't change the training. I mean, in certain situations, your body will develop enough adrenaline to be able to do more than it would mm -hmm. in whatever is not an actual serious situation. So they just want to make sure that you get your adrenaline up by exercising at first in order for you to be able to pull up somebody if needed. So the training for the science side of scuba diving, you have enriched air nitrox and the science of diving. Enriched air nitrox, you're breathing higher partial pressures of oxygen, and they are learning the limitations of breathing higher partial pressures of oxygen. They are learning the process of mixing different gases along with the procedures of use. Now, the science of diving course, they take a more developed look into the physics, physiology, ecology, and the mechanics of scuba equipment. Now, both of these courses are all just classroom work. They don't have any open water training, but it is a lot of different. To the training for the deeper depths. You have deep diving and you have extended range or technical diving. So the deep diving, you are experiencing the effects of higher partial pressures at depth firsthand. You have to complete a 60 foot dive, an 80 foot dive, and a 100 foot dive. So they learn how to plan and execute dives while reducing the risk of higher partial pressures at depth. And then the extended range or technical diving, they learn how to go further, go beyond, and go deeper. And for technical diving, it is a lot more training, but they also get to do more set balance diving. So dive tables. Dive tables are used to calculate how much air and time a diver will have at the certain depth they want to achieve. At the top, you will, hard to see, but they find the air they are breathing, and they get down to the depth that they want to achieve. And they can go across and find out how much uh, time they are able to spend at that depth. And they will drop down, and that letter at the bottom for the second dive table will tell them how much time their no decompression time is, which will be how much time it takes for their body to bleed out the nitrogen that they just absorbed. So 80 to 100 deaths annually are due to diving injuries, and 85 to 90 percent of these diving injuries or cases are due to the diver's error. But around 80 percent of these um, cases are gas-related problems, but gas-related problems are avoidable. Is this just the United States or is this worldwide? This is just worldwide. Oh, okay. So if these injuries are avoidable, then why do they occur? So the physiological effects of certain gases, that certain gases have on scuba divers at depth are air or gas embolism, spontaneous pneumothorax, mediastinal emphysema, subcutaneous emphysema, decompression sickness, oxygen toxicity, and natural genotoxicity. And divers overcome these physiological effects by understanding how to prevent them from happening or to how to assess the situation whenever it occurs. And as risks get more severe, there are less chances of them or divers being able to overcome them. But this is why they try to avoid them from happening or how to assess them so they don't get worse. So the divers dive, it consists of four things. You have knowledge, skills, equipment, and experience. The knowledge replaces the anxiety and fear with the knowledge of what to do. 
The skills are learned throughout the training up until they're comfortable with it so that they can be comfortable in their own skin diving in the water. The equipment is their own equipment. It allows them to have more comfort and more confidence in themselves whenever they're going underwater. And the experience is learned on their own time to gain more confidence in their skills. So the personal achievements I have in the field, I have my open water, my react right chest and rescue, perfect buoyancy, night limited visibility, equipment techniques, and rich nitrox science of diving and my deep diving. And with roughly 20 more dives, I will have achieved my master diver, which is earned through experience and training. And this picture is taken of me at Blue Grotto in Florida. Where have you um, done the majority of your dives? Um, well, I got my, cert my first certification in Lake Hickory. But, uh, I'm well, glad she. <laughs> <laughs> Not very uh, far visibility, but I got all right other. Uh, I got majority of mine at, in Florida, in like the Springs or Blue Grotto, just places around there okay. because it's really clear up there. So a quote that I really enjoyed was, we dive not to escape life, but for life not to escape us. And this was the first quote I saw whenever I started getting into this build because my boss has a tattoo right here and he's been diving for forever. I just think it's really cool. Don't know who said it, but they're pretty cool. <laughs> and this picture was taken after I completed my deep dive of 100 foot. And I completed that certification after that. And I um, congratulated myself by becoming friends with the turtle named Virgil. And I pet him. And that is all. <clears throat> um, can any of these certifications be accomplished in like a pool? I mean, since you said you did one in the lake, I mean, is, if you find a pool deep enough, is, does anybody do anything like um, that? The open water and the React Right Trust Rescue, they have their confined water or their pool training. Mm -hmm. Um, but they still have to do open water dives, whether it be in a lake, the springs, they can go pretty much anywhere, they can go, like, anywhere to take these. But, um, they, some of them have confined water or pool trainings. I did my React Right Trust and Rescue confined water in Lake Hickory, but it just depends. Okay. <clears throat> Additional questions, guys? Um, what would you say is the biggest mistake people make um, that, even if it doesn't lead to something lethal, but it's something that you would consider you know, extremely dangerous, you know, as far as like what the symptoms were? What, what is the most common mistake that people make? Personally, I think that the biggest mistake that people make, or that divers make, is that they don't listen to the regulations that are set for their safety. They're like, oh, well, that's not going to happen to me. I can do it still. So they go to these limits that, or their recreational limit without the training, so they start experiencing the things that they don't know to do. And divers, they have to dive with the buddy. I mean, they don't have to, but it's really advised because some, anything can happen really underwater. So whenever they do that, they are putting themselves and their buddies in danger. Anybody else? All right, guys, let's give her three on three. One, two, three. Great job. Great job. Just as soon as you're ready. So I had no idea there were all those different mixes. I thought everybody's tank was the same. Huh? That's amazing. But it makes sense now. Why? Good job. Thank you. In summer, when, when somebody uh, comes back up and they just have like they have a bunch of busted blood vessels. Is that because of pressure? Is that because of? Uh, that can be because of pressure, or there's another. Well, not because of problems with sinus leaks. Uh -huh. They still pressure. They don't um, <laughs> need blood thinners or other which means that they have a pressure buildup and it's not equalized. So it results in headaches, vomiting. Yeah, that still kind of freaks me out. I'm just like, <laughs> I have, I have a lot of trouble just. Yeah. Trusting and taking a breath when you're underwater, my body does not want to do it. Even when it does breathe, and often it's normal, it's like I panic and it doesn't seem right. And so it's just my body has rejected this kind of like. Yeah, well, I have like, like, the skills that you learn on that first uh, certification. Uh -huh. The first skill is allowing yourself to breathe underwater. Right. Understanding. So yeah, you need to take 
in like a minute just to realize that they can breathe under water, whereas other people take like an hour. Yeah, I have a feeling that it'll take me, like I'd be okay if I got enough practice, but like I've just done so little in my life that like, it just it always freaks me out. So now I'm to the point where I don't want to try anymore. <laughs> you did very well, thank you. Thank you. All right.